Hello BC. I have not done a vinyl oriented video for quite a while now, which had mostly to do with the fact that I was a bit busy. I'm finalizing a manuscript and uh, the next book is coming out, well, in some weeks. So I had a lot to do with that, with the publishing house and so on. But um, yesterday I found time to listen to music a little more and uh, somehow it turned out to be a day of French music. I didn't start it out that way, but that's what it turned out to be. So um, the first album I want to show you is a little bit older and it's from the mid 60s. And now um, in the mid 60s something interesting happened in France where under the influence of, uh, of the Beatles, the Stones and most certainly Bob Dylan, a whole vibrant beat culture emerged. So this was a starting point for some very big names like, um, well, mostly Serge Gainsbourg or Sylvie, Sylvie Vartan. And um, the Boulevard Press tried to give it a name of sorts, a kind of a stamp, and so they called it Ye yeah, Ye yeah, Music. But uh, I would make the point that most of this of the significant artists of this time would probably have rejected this kind of classification. So one of the names heavily connected uh, with this style and time and age is Antoine. And uh, Antoine is a singer-songwriter that has uh, quite an amazing biography. So he was very popular in the late 60s, but um, Many times in his career he just uh, dropped out of the circuit for a couple of years and, uh, for example, became a sailor. He wrote books, he made movies, documentaries, uh, he was a photographer. So this is someone who has always quite lived in the moment uh, and uh, just did those things that his heart was calling for. So during his uh, popular years in the late 60s, he had, uh, well, in terms of publicity, he had a quite an effective uh, feud or rivalry going on um, with his colleague Johnny Halliday, who was probably the most famous French singer at the time. So they dissed each other in song lyrics, for example, a little bit like uh, hip-hop artists are doing this today. But um, they did it already in the 60s in France. <laughs> so um, this album here um, by Antoine is from 1966 and it is called, well, and I have to look a little bit just to be sure, uh, it is called Madame Laure Messanger, Claude Jeremy, L'Existence des Dieux. Now the title, of course, sounds quite convoluted, but once you start to look into it, it all seems to fall into place. So um, this is of course a very uh, lyrically oriented music and um, now I don't claim to fully understand French songs when I hear them so my French is rather shabby and uh, so um, but of course today you can find everything on the internet so I am much better in reading French than uh, understanding it or speaking it. So taking the title of the album, which means in English Madame Laure Messanger, Claude Jeremy and the existence of God, um, it is about uh, basically two goldfish living with Madame Messanger and these two goldfish names are Claude and Jeremy. And these goldfish have, uh, have oftentimes uh, debates, they talk about philosophical and theological matters, for example, questioning the existence of God. And one of them argues that there must be a God because someone is changing the water in the fish bowl all the time. Um, while uh, Antoine argues, yeah, I thought the same about women getting pregnant, but then I found out that it's not God that makes that. So uh, there is a lot of um, uh, thought-provoking <laughs> and uh, controversial humor in this, uh, as you would expect from, from, uh, from a French lyricist. So this is an interesting album. It comes with a lot of musicians here. So um, the sound is versatile. Uh, it's a good example of French uh, 
pop or rock music of the mid 60s. Antoine. It came out on Disc Vogue over here 1967. Very well. So after that, I listened to Gazeus by Gong. Now it's being said that this is the first uh, official Gong album of the famous the Pierre Morlin lineup. But well, personally, I disagree with that a little bit because I think that their previous album, Shamao, uh, is actually the first album of this uh, of this lineup, uh, even though not officially. But uh, I mean, Shamal already transports the kind of sound that uh, the French variant of Gong has become so famous for. Now, Gazeus is the European title of this album. When they put it out in the USA, they called it Espresso. This is also the last Gong album before the amazing Hans Ford Rowe entered the stage and uh, it came with a big poster that I got here in this issue. So I was already on a roll, so I continued with Espresso 2 by Gong, which they put out next year, here with uh, Hans Ford Rowe on bass. Again, uh, there is Alan Holdsworth playing on it, Mick Taylor. This is great sound. I really like the French gong uh, permutation. Uh, it's of course not this kind of psychedelic music that uh, people mostly associate with the old gong, with Alan's gong. But um, I always like this. I always like this. This. Uh, clear sounding fusion style that they develop by using uh, all these uh, percussive uh, instruments like glockenspiel and vibraphone and so on. So I'm a big fan of, uh, of Pierre Morlin's Gong. Yeah, now um, after that I kind of realized that I'm listening to French bands all the time, so why not stay on the track? And I put on something completely different. The soundtrack to Nikita by Eric Serra. Yeah, this was uh, this was sort of a third movie by Luc Besson in terms of uh, international release, and uh, um, yeah, the, it's a great soundtrack. It's a very 80s sounding soundtrack, but uh, it's a nice postcard, a musical postcard from a different time, I would say. I mean, there are only two or three. Um, full songs on it. The rest is a little bit sketchy because those are rather cues and themes for a, for a movie. Now, I have not listened to his other soundtracks yesterday, but I have them on CD, which is uh, of course Subway, Le Grand Bleu. Yeah, so of course Eric Serra is a great bass guitar player, so uh, you always get good bass playing and good slapping on his albums. Now, of course, uh, no introduction needed for the next name that I listened to is Jean-Michel Jarre. Now, uh, Equinox was, uh, uh, if I remember right, his second album. Um, I didn't, I didn't pay that much attention to Jean-Michel Jarre when I was younger. Well, it's kind of the same case like with Vangelis. Uh, Back in the day, I kind of felt it just wasn't dark enough for me and gloomy enough for me. And so um, I've, I've always uh, respected it, but rather kept ignoring it most of the time. But later when I started to collect vinyl, you just um, always come across uh, those albums. And sometimes they were very cheap, so you just buy them for kicks. And um, after a while you realize, oh, I have a quite a little stack full of Jean-Michel Jarre albums. It's about time that I start to listen to it. Which uh, turns out to be an interesting journey, because um, um, he is an incredible musician. And uh, it is fascinating how he was always able to control these horrendous beasts of 70s synthesizers. Now this is not an easy thing to do. Those were not just the kind of instruments like today that you switch on and you search for a cool sound and then you play. This is not how 
how uh, this, how an ARP or how uh, how a MOOC works. So uh, he's an incredible musician and uh, an excellent technician. And uh, so I spent listening Jean-Michel Jarre for the rest of the day. Continuing with uh, Le Champ Magnétique, which in the in the English version is called the Magnetic Fields, which is a bit peculiar because uh, the original French title is Le Champ Magnétique, so which means the magnetic uh, songs or the magnetic uh, uh, voices, maybe. Um, it's, it's, it's a wordplay because the French word chant kind of sounds like chant with a PM at the end, which is fields then. But of course it sounded cooler with fields in English. But um, yeah, it's one of those gags that get completely lost in the translation. Um, and uh, that's a quite nicely done sleeve here. Now, most of the albums by Jean-Michel Jarre came out on Disc Dreyfus. So uh, it's a chance to show some different label that you probably don't see every day here. Now, uh, after completing this album, he went on tour and made a famous string of concerts, which became a, his first live album called The Concerts in China. Now, this is a very uh, interesting live album because uh, this came out in 1982. And so he went to China um, to perform like two or three days. I think he was playing in Beijing and in Shanghai, I think. And um, I mean, you have to look this up on, on, on Wikipedia when there's a whole story behind this concert and, uh, and the, the difficulties that he experienced. I mean, there are things that kind of the, the party wanted him to do and there are things that he wanted to do, but they didn't want to do. There were stuff going on like a very carefully pre-chosen audience and uh, a lot of the people in the audience it's the beginning of the 80s they kind of didn't really didn't know how to react to the music and what to do and so he started to for the next concert he came up with new ideas and started to interfere with the audience uh, to uh, interact with them and and um, so it's very it's a very interesting story behind it what came out is a uh, quite impressive live album uh, as i said before um if it means that um doing this kind of music in the 70s with this kind of synthesizers was difficult in the studio. How much more difficult uh, it is uh, doing this live. So this was always very impressive. Bands like uh, bands like uh, Tangerine Dream or, uh, or Vangelis or Jean-Michel Jarre, they, they were not just some button pushers. This, is, this was so complex and so difficult just to get these instruments in tune. And there's a, there a nice video of Jean-Michel Jarre's concert, something he did the last years on YouTube. You have to look it up when you have like five minutes time when these three musicians on stage just kind of tune their instruments. And uh, if you watch that, you just realize, yeah, they really know what they're doing. <laughs> so um, this came out as a double album. Came out in a really nice gatefold sleeve. Like this. Yeah. Also, it has this cool inner sleeves, sort of a lot of Chinese atmosphere on them. Look here. And uh, Finally, um, this is Zuluk by Jean-Michel Jarre. That's the kind of music he started to do after that, just a couple of years after the Chinese concert. It's probably my favorite album by Jean-Michel Jarre. It's, it's the beginning of a new era where he suddenly, um, well, starts to 
work more band oriented. So uh, you have some interesting people playing here. There's Laurie Anderson on this album, Adrian Bellew. So uh, what's not to like? Zulu. Yeah, and that's it for now. So this was my French excursion into vinyl music. So see you next time and keep it spinning. Au revoir.